Welcome to the Flourish Academy podcast. My name is Heather Lawton, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host Mara Chick. We believe that everyone can be successful in any endeavor they pursue, whether it's personal or professional, by constantly nourishing your mind, reading books. You can impart wisdom and tactics into your life and business. In this podcast, we will be discussing the books that have impacted us and share actionable strategies at the end of each episode to help you succeed. So you just sit right there or run, or whatever you're doing listening to this podcast, and we'll do the reading for you. Today, we are going to finish our discussion on Big Potential by Sean Acor. Not The Big Potential, but right. Mara likes to call it The Big Potential. And the subtitle is, How Transforming the Pursuit of Success Raises Our Achievement, Happiness, and Well-Being. Ooh, Sounds yeah. pretty lofty, this Sean. Is... <laughs> Good try, Sean. <laughs> Getting us there. Okay, we're going to dive straight into chapter six on page 146 if you're following along. Okay, contrary to what many people believe, emotions like sadness, fear, and anger do not obstruct the path to big potential. To the contrary, there are they are necessary and useful. I say in my talks that the opposite of happiness is not unhappiness. Unhappiness can, in fact, fuel incredible positive change. Unhappiness reminds me when I'm lonely and need to reach out to my friends. Unhappiness tells me when I'm doing something that goes against my core values. And unhappiness tells me when my work is not in line with my priorities. The opposite of joy is not sadness. It is apathy, which is the loss of energy to continue to pursue one's goals. If you lose your joy, the pursuit of big potential becomes both meaningless and and futile. This bears repeating. The opposite of joy is not sadness. It's apathy. So prior to recording, we spent a fairly significant amount of time discussing apathy mm -hmm. because you lose your passion, your fire. You just don't care. That's bad. If you are feeling apathetic, then I encourage you to find a way to fight out of it. You spark have that to, joy. You have you to have spark to. it. Right. Absolutely. I mean, no one can control it but you. Don't sit around and expect somebody else to be able to spark joy for you. You have to do it for you. Okay. I'm not, you know, my husband, we've shared on the podcast before that my hus husband suffers from depression. So he, <laughs> he does not have much joy in his life, but. I'm going to give him as much joy as I can, but it is his decision to say, okay, let's go do this. And, and of course he ends up happy. I mean, he should just listen to me in the first place and just stop fighting me. Right. But and it would work it out. It would work out him. great for right. him. Okay. <laughs> okay. Back to the book on page 148. He says, we learned about how our brains are programmed for emotional and social contagion. Am I saying that right? Contagion. 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 See, finally, you stumble on a word. <laughs> Usually it's me that blah, blah, blah. No, Contagion. <laughs> yeah, con something that's contagious. And how the presence of even one positive person in a community can actually infect everyone in it with positivity. By the same token, research shows that we can also pick up negative negativity, stress, and apathy like secondhand smoke. In fact, researchers have found that simply observing someone who is stressed, especially a co-worker or family, can have an immediate effect upon our own nervous systems, raising our levels of the stress hormone cortisol by as much as 26%. I have a question for you. Oh, gosh. Okay. He says... Observing someone who is stressed, especially a coworker or family member, can have immediate effects. How do you guard yourself against your husband's apathy? I ignore it. I'm sorry. I have to separate myself from it. So when I see that he's like on the sofa and not like energized to do anything, I go upstairs and clean a room or I go up to my office and do something like I will separate myself from him because I don't want to be pulled into that trap. And we had talked in an earlier episode about how, you know, when I realized I couldn't change him, I had to learn how to change myself mm -hmm. to be able to you live yes. with him. Yes. And that was one of the things I learned was just get up and go away from it. Get away from his negativity. So you it's not negativity. It's just no desire to do much. So, um, and I know he listens to the podcast now. I used to make jokes that, Oh, I can talk about Tony all I want because <laughs> now he doesn't we, listen we know to the he podcast listens. and now he listens. <laughs> I love you, sweetheart. But <laughs> I like, I have to get away from it. Right. That, and that's my only and take resource. action. And I so take ac I have to do something yeah. physical. Well, that's really smart Thanks. that you learned that I did how to deal that's with it and how to guard your own heart, still be there and be supportive, but to yeah. protect your own mind. That's it's really smart. Thing. It is. Yes. 
Okay, we're going to move straight to page 165 and 166. Um, so on page 165, so, and he starts to talk about stress, which this world is stressed. <laughs> yes. Um, so if you notice yourself beginning to feel stressed about something, ask yourself, why does this matter? Think about why you care, write it down if you need to, and stick that piece of paper to your computer monitor or refrigerator as a constant reminder. I think we forget, like, stress is a sign that, like, we really, he says uh, um, before that, we stress about things only when we care about them. So I stress a lot, and I guess I must really care a lot about stuff. <laughs> but, like, it's true. I stress about the things I care about because I want to make sure things are right and ready to go. Right. So um, why does it matter? That's a pretty key question. That is a key question because if it's something that you care about, then you need to do something, then stress can be a good mm -hmm. sign. But if it's something meaningless or silly or something outside of your control, then maybe it's something you can choose to ignore. He goes on to say uh, something you just said. Behind every stressor, there lurks something you care about. You can either fight it or you can use it as a source of energy and motivation. Mm. If you go through stress with the right lens alongside others, you can create meaningful narratives and social bonds that you will talk about for the rest of your life. So identifying the stress, asking yourself, should I care about this? Why do I care about this? And if the reason is good and it makes sense, then okay, I need to change something. Or is it something that you can't change or doesn't make sense? Then you need to figure out a way to move beyond it. Yes. Okay, we're going to move to page 168. Uh, you can always find someone who is sharing in your struggle, whether they are coworkers, fellow classmates, or even people you don't know personally, but whom you might meet through your network or through a support group. Once you've reminded yourself that your burden isn't yours to carry alone, challenge yourself to do anything you can to help these people rather than simply commiserate with them. This reframes the threat as an opportunity to strengthen your empathy muscle as well as bonds of your support system. Second, pay attention to the way you talk about the stressful things in your life. When you get home, instead of describing your work responsibilities as annoying, frustrating, or overwhelming, talk about the opportunities they provide to build new relationships, learn new things, and raise your potential. Okay, I hit on this kind of in an earlier episode where, like, I don't like to commiserate with people because I feel like when someone's talking to me, I'm going to listen to you, but I'm not going to echo back like, Oh yeah, he's a dude. Yeah. That's horrible. Okay? But right. like, I'm going to help you like figure out how we look at this as a positive experience and where's the opportunity to grow. How did it make you stronger? Like what's the good outcome from it? So just kind of limit. The, what did you learn? The negativity from how do we, we talked about reframing. Yes, that's reframe. what it was. It. Yes, we reframe. reframing. Everything's an opportunity. So instead of saying this is stressful and annoying, is it an opportunity to learn and grow? Why not reframe it and use those words? Because language is very powerful in terms of how your brain sees that particular challenge. You can reframe it and you can use it as an opportunity. Yeah. 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 I'm agreeing with you. Thank there. you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to move to page 173 and he starts talking about taking vacation from your problems and, and getting your brain right. So uh, he, Sean says, when the brain is positive, productivity improves by 31% and sales by 37%. Creativity triples and revenues can triple as well. And in a subsequent Harvard Business Review article that was based on a decade of research, I concluded that the greatest competitive advantage in the modern economy is a positive and engaged brain. So you can give yourself a huge advantage just by choosing to be positive and engaged. A huge advantage, which means increased productivity and uh, for those who are monetary-based, increased paychecks. Hello. Uh, <laughs> more, more money. money. <laughs> Doesn't everyone want more money? I mean, <laughs> assuming you like money, I guess it's a tool. Like money. Right. Okay, um, we're going to move now. That's it for Chapter 6. We're going to move straight into Chapter 7, which is um, talking about sustaining the gains and um, creating collective momentum. This is a topic I think we touched on in the compound effect mm. was about momentum. Momentum. It's yes, a, we did. a lovely topic. So just to introduce this chapter, I'm going to read this um, from page 180 and 181. Okay. The more energy, energy you channel in a positive direction, the more power you have to pull others along with you. And this chapter will learn how to become one of these magnets, pulling people towards you and helping them channel their energy toward their big potential. 
Objects in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Without a positive force driving us to continue, we will slow down due to the friction of life and the unbalanced negative influences in our world. The default is negative. So you have to stay focused on the positive and you have to keep the momentum. And when the momentum ends, you better find a way to kick it off again or it's just going to get harder. Oh, right. You're getting a little bossy there. <laughs> Could you tone it down? A step? Right. <laughs> <laughs> momentum, we do like each other. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just, we talk about momentum in our businesses all yes. the time and how important it is when you have it, you need to stick with it because you know that if you lose it, it's going to be so much harder. It's like 10 times the effort, effort to get it right, back to where right, it was. Right. I feel that now. Like I'm just like momentum, moment. So I'm, I'm maybe not as pushing as hard, but I don't stop. I'm no. not going to stop. No, you can't. I'm going to just build and build who, and build. Who wants to go back to square one? You've no. worked so hard to get where you are. You want to you want to reach further, not backslide. I'm not going back. No, you're not. In this chapter, he talks about, again, what you were just saying, sustaining what we're working on. And back to the book on page 192, he's talking about visualization. So mm. visualizing yourself in a better future. He says there is a huge body of research suggesting that mental imagery can dramatically impact our actions. This research coming out of Oxford and Cambridge suggests that your ability to vividly imagine details about a bright future dramatically increases your energy and momentum, which in turn leads to constructive action. When our mind's eye can picture exactly what the future looks like, it can orient itself in the direction of the bright future we envision. Do you visualize or picture or do mental mapping about what you want something to look like in your life? Every day. Do you? Yes. That's awesome. So we've talked about some big plans I have for next year. Um, and I visualize myself actually doing... Okay, it's like this big Women's Day event, and I just like speakers and breakout sessions, and just there's a lot of ideas in my head. But I actually visualize myself walking around, like where it's going to be, walking around, getting this in order, getting that in order, coming up and giving my talk, and then going and doing my break. Like I visualize with so much detail because I want it to become reality. So the more details I use, the more it's going to come true. Plus, I write things down all the time. Like, I'm a vivid, like, imagination. You are. I just have to, like, I see all these colors and just, like, I feel the feelings, too. And that's, like, they're so vivid. I actually wrote in my book next to this section, like, vivid, because I want it, like, I want it to be clear. How did you learn this? How did you learn how to do this? I feel like you've been doing this a little a bit long longer time. than, yeah, I have. For I sure. Know. I think I've always just sat around and dreamed a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, because I felt like this is there's something better out there for me. There's always something else to do and something I want to challenge myself to do. So I'm just sit and think. Right. I think it's, I've always taken time to think about my bit. Like I have my think day, which I've blogged about on the Flourish Academy's mm -hmm. um, website, but you know, it's important for me to like focus on my business for a day. And so that's how like the think day started was just like dreaming and well, I think what makes you so successful at it is the degree of specificity mm -hmm. when you say you imagine colors and you picture it and what it's going to look like. Charles Duhigg talked about this in Smarter, Faster, Better, and he said successful people will mentally map their days with just one degree more specificity mm -hmm. than other people, and then everything just, you know, works out for them. <laughs> oh, magically, <laughs> like, oh, right, right. I right. dreamed it and it, it happened. I'm not going to say it doesn't take a ton of work. It does, right. but... You know, me visualizing it certainly helps. Right. Okay. So moving to page 196, uh, Sean says, Just as positive visualiz visualizations help us direct our energy toward positive outcomes, visualizing a negative future can stop our momentum in its tracks. Boom. Drops yeah. the mic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm so professional. And you don't have to um, try to, to visualize negative. That will yes. just happen. And he said that um, Brene... Brene Brown, um, she warns her audiences against dress rehearsing tragedy when she describes what she describes as mentally experiencing a theoretical future tragedy as it were a real event. So what do we do? We play out all these negative scenarios. Wow. And you give the negative way too much focus. Hey, guess what's going to happen when you focus on the negative? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Self-fulfilling prophecy. And we're not saying that like things 
negative things don't happen. But if you're giving your focus to that. But why would you try to make it happen? Knowing this information, now that you know this information. Well, you better stop. You better stop. So if you, I have a friend who told me about this visualization she has that involves her daughter getting hurt. And I said, listen, you, I understand where that's coming from. You need to break it immediately. When you find yourself doing that, you need to instantly distract yourself with something else because your brain will continue to go there by default. And then God forbid something happens. Oh, uh, you just, you can't take, don't even mm-hmm. entertain I know. it. Then you're going to blame yourself. Like, look, I spent so much time or see, I told you so it was going to happen. Well, no crap. It happened because you, you made it right. happen. Right. Um, so yeah, just watch what you're doing as far as like n- the negativity goes. Okay. Heather. Okay. Page um, 199. Um, give page it to us. 199. He says one of the most effective and well-studied ways to vividly envision our future is to write about it. The act of consciously crafting your narrative of an event, past or future, directs our energy towards it. In one study, researcher Laura King found that when people wrote about their best possible self, the type of person they aspire to become and think is possible to become, their health and well-being significantly improved just by writing about it. So something you said a moment ago was you write these things out, which is critical. So it's not just about visualizing and imagining. That's step one. Step two is to physically write it down. And what he's saying here, if you think about it, is mind-blowing. If you just write down things that you think attributes of your best possible self, your health and well-being will improve just by writing it down. Because your brain will go... It will activate, mm-hmm. will go into action to try to get you to that point because of that specificity and that clarity. Wow. If all I have to do is write down about how awesome things are going to be, why not just try it? <laughs> well, you don't have anything to lose. You okay? don't. Even if it doesn't you you know, come to fruition. But, <laughs> you know, we've talked a lot. A lot of things that we talk about in our podcast are all about writing it down because I think one of the books we want to do is write it down, make it happen, which I love that book. Um, so... Why not give it a try? And listen, I know it's hard when we tell you to write stuff down and we're not telling you to go write a a book (laughs) of what you want or how you're visualizing things, but just go write three or four sentences. This is a good point because you're a very good writer and I am not. So I can tend to feel intimidated because I think, well, I can't write like Mara. So how much? So my, my visualizations that I write down are not as eloquent as yours are, but they get the point across. That's I mean, okay. a second grader could read it. Keep trying <laughs> right? to be me. Okay. Thanks. But I you still you leave the that. talent to me. Okay, okay. Thank you. Will you write down my visualization? <laughs> sure. I will. You okay. just talk and I'll write. All right. Got it. <laughs> okay. Um, then Sean moves into talking about celebrating the wins, which we have talked, you know, about earlier in the book. Um, you've heard Heather use the term micro wins. It's one of her favorites. favorites. Yep. Little sayings. Um, So you just want to kind of celebrate along the way and make sure that you're pulling in the people who have actually brought you to success. So um, even those people that may not have been there day to day, but every time you saw them, they they gave you some kind of validation or acknowledgement for what you're doing or were there to listen to you. But the one piece that really struck me is on page 203. So I'm going to read that right now. Simply celebrating a person or a team for their companionship, their strengths, their everyday contributions, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, reinforces a more empowered self-image and helps them see a vivid image of themselves as someone who is worthy of happiness and success. Likewise, celebrating someone for being kind, creative, or hardworking helps them see a vivid image of themselves as someone who is kind, creative, or hardworking. In doing so, you become a magnet helping to pull more and more of their energy in that direction. Well, are you a magnet? Okay, so uh, my son Evan is 10, and he's a boy, so he does 10-year-old boy things. And every night when we're putting him to bed, I say to him, you are a wise leader. You make good decisions. I say this over. Okay. Secret. He does not make good decisions, <laughs> nor is he a leader. Okay. That's okay. Well, that's not yet. Like, not yet. So I say this over and over and I've been doing it for years. And last year at school, he came home with a note from his teacher that says, Evan has been selected for the leadership team, the leadership committee, which is an elite group of students who exemplify leadership in the school district. And, you know, it has all these characteristics. I was almost brought to my knees. I mean, in tears, I could, I I showed it to Craig and I said, can you even believe I, I, 
all because every night I would say, you're a wise leader. You make great decisions. You make good decisions mm. and over and over. So guess what? That narrative, he believed it. I was very vivid with it and he believed it in his brain and then he became it. And I still do that. I still tell him, you are a beautiful, wonderful creation of God. You're a wise leader. You make good decisions all the time. Every night I say that to him and he believes it about himself. It's a, that's amazing. That's Just great. By so you can do that with yourself as well. You can tell yourself a narrative about who you want to become, envisioning a better future, a better picture of yourself, a better version. And you can get there just by telling your brain and then writing it down and making it happen. Whoa, mind blowing. <laughs> I love it. I okay, love as it. we wrap up chapter six and seven, which is essentially the end of the book. I mean, he does go into like a little summary. But our strategy for the end is just to practice gratitude. I think it's very important for us, especially as business owners and, and people trying to advance like just their personal development, that we really have an attitude of gratitude. Okay, so I want you to write down three things every day that were great. You know, I was working with a client yesterday, actually, and she said she was having trouble with panic attacks recently. Mm. They just came out of nowhere. Yeah. She never had them her whole life and then all of a sudden was having them. And she was working with a therapist who wanted her to write down in the morning three things she was grateful for and in the evening three things she was grateful. For. Now, this was part of a bigger strategy, but she said it changed her life. Just within a couple of months' time, she said, I'm a completely different person because I'm so focused on what's going right. Isn't that amazing? But you have to write it down. Mm -hmm. Write it down. Okay, Heather, as we wrap up, well, let's just talk real quick. How, like, this is probably one of our favorite books. This book blew my mind. We bought it. We read it in a few days. I, I read it in like a day and a half. I was, I devoured it. So and then we told everybody we knew. about it. <laughs> buy so this book. You have to buy this book. It's Big Potential by Sean Acor or The Big Potential, as I like to call it. But no, it's Big Potential. Um, and as we wrap up, this series can you tell everyone how they can support this podcast this awesome amazing podcast this is pretty fun hey if you're gonna buy big potential use our amazon affiliate mm -hmm. link that helps offset some of the expenses that we incur yeah because i know you already shop on amazon people. right <laughs> so please use our link that really really helps make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast player like, share, leave a review, share with your friends, tell your friends. That helps get it in more yeah. hands of people because you can become that ripple we effect. Want, yeah, we want to have an impact. We really do. I know that sounds lofty and like, oh, who are they? But we really do want to have an impact on lives And we believe others. we can yeah. with your help, with your yeah. help for sure. If you want to see the video version of this, you can go to flourishacademy.tv. My hair and makeup are looking good. No. <laughs> so you can see Mara. <laughs> and Heather. Heather's on there too. It's not just me. <laughs> And make sure you visit the website, flourish.academy slash podcast. Mara puts the show notes along with her strategies on the podcast so that you can implement them in case you're listening to this as you're driving or maybe exercising and you want to check that out later. Make sure you go to flourish.academy slash podcast. Yeah, because I'm the writer. Remember that. Not my gifts. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone so much for listening today. We'll catch you on the next episode.